there is this uh, belief that a lot of men practice that they should be sexual on a moment's notice. They should be able to have an erection spontaneously. The minute their partner says, let's go, they should be at the ready. And the reality is, is that, you know, men are three-dimensional humans with their own needs and experiences as well. And so one of the conflicts that I witness a lot is that people are stressed, they're tired, they're hungry, they didn't get a chance to exercise, they didn't sleep enough. And this belief that like they should still want to feel sexual or they should still want sex, even given all these other stressors. We are here with another episode of the Erectile Dysfunction Radio Podcast. Today we are joined by Natalie Feingood Goldberg. Natalie is an LMFT, it's a licensed marriage and family therapist and a certified sex therapist, as well as a sex therapy supervisor. And she has a group practice in Los Angeles. She has extensive experience working with people to resolve sexual dysfunction, including and specifically erectile dysfunction. She joins us today to discuss performance anxiety and ED and give us insights and perspective on this important topic. Natalie, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. Okay, so to get us started, Natalie, can you just share just a little bit about yourself, the work that you do, and your practice? Uh, Yeah. So like you mentioned, I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. Uh, I actually have a group practice, so it's myself, and then I have... Uh, one pre-licensed associate and two licensed associates. Uh, We all specialize in sex therapy. So we all deal with sexual issues kind of all day, every day. So to get us started in the conversation about um, erectile dysfunction, can you explain from your perspective the relationship between performance anxiety and erectile dysfunction, particularly how these psychological factors can impact the physical responses? So erectile dysfunction is a symptom of performance anxiety. What happens with performance anxiety is that all of the sort of panic hormones in our body get set off. And one of the things we know is that it sort of puts us in fight or flight. And when we are in fight or flight, all of the blood goes to our extremities. Um, So as much as a lot of people would like to think that their penis is an extremity, it's not. Um, it, the blood goes to your arms and your legs, because if you're in the woods and you're being chased by a bear, you need to run or fight the bear. Uh, you don't need to be having sex in that moment. So the performance anxiety, it kicks off all these hormones. It sends all the blood to your extremities and all the blood away from your penis. One of the things we know about an erection is that it needs blood. So when people enter into the performance anxiety mode or this fight or flight mode, from a physiological perspective, it just sends everything in the wrong direction. Okay. So in other words, what, what people are uh, thinking and feeling is going to have like a, sounds like pretty much a direct impact on the physiology, on the signals that are being sent down from the brain to the body. And when people are in fight or flight mode, it sounds like blood is being directed to the primary sources, the primary places where it needs to be, which is not the penis. Correct. Yes. Uh, so, Natalie, what what exactly is performance anxiety? It's a question that comes up a lot from our listeners. And how does it manifest in men who are experiencing erection issues? I think on the most basic level, performance anxiety is the panic that ensues when somebody feels or believes that they need to, quote unquote, perform. They need to do something And oftentimes in those moments, they feel like their body is not doing what they think it should be doing. And so the panic or the anxiety sets in because, you know, if the expectation is you're supposed to get on stage and sing a beautiful song and all of a sudden nothing comes out, your body will sort of kick into panic mode. And so for a lot of people with a penis, when they are being sexual and their body is not responding the way they want it to, or they're concerned that it's not going to respond the way they want it to, this panic sets in. And for men with ED or men who are experiencing erection challenges, is there anything unique to how that performance anxiety might manifest as compared to somebody who is performing on stage? For men with ED or performance anxiety specifically as it relates to ED, I do notice a bit of a theme in that there tends to be some insecurity or some doubts around 
their sexuality, their, um, their sexual knowledge, their sexual performance abilities, uh, their ability to please their partner, there tends to be some insecurity in the realm of sex or more as it relates to their gender, what it means to be a man, how, how to perform being a man. Oftentimes performing being a man means, you know, getting an erection in these particular moments. So I do find that for people who tend to feel less secure in those domains, they are more likely to experience performance anxiety. Okay, which which again makes a lot of sense. In your experience, do you find that there are different channels or different ways that performance anxiety manifests itself? At least, you know, the thoughts, um, like you just mentioned, there's like a couple different categories of performance anxiety thoughts, whether it's constructs around masculinity, uh, concerns about performance. I imagine it could also be, um, you know, fear about partner reaction. Does that make a difference in your experience in terms of outcomes. What I mean by that is, you know, sometimes men are struggling with gaining an erection. Sometimes they're st struggling with maintaining an erection. Men can lose erections at different points in the process. Have you found like any association between, you know, different, we'll call them subtypes or subcategories of performance anxiety and the particular manifestations of ED? Yes, I would say yes. Uh, part of it, I think, is sort of how deeply ingrained the uh, cognitive distortions are. So for example, I will be alone forever is much harder to treat than this particular partner is going to leave me if I can't get this figured out. Or, you know, somebody who, for example, is struggling with their understanding of themselves sexually, you know, people who feel broken, uh, it's much more challenging than somebody who had no issues with their sexual functioning over time. And then all of a sudden they have this one-off experience. I'm like, what's wrong with me? My body's not working the way I want it to is very different than somebody who believes, oh my God, I am broken. Okay. In other words, like if I'm hearing you correctly, you're saying that there's like layers of depth, like uh, not all yes. um, performance like the anxiety. Intensity. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, not all performance the... anxiety thoughts operate at the same level. So people can have like mm -hmm. really like, deep seated, like, like fears that like, it, it, I might lose a relationship versus I will be alone for the rest of my life. You can just hear the intensity difference in all of that. Yeah. You're saying that it makes a real difference in, in, you know, how that anxiety gets expressed in the body and also like what the treatment for it looks like. Right. Right. Like one thing I often tell people, because I always get that magical question over the phone of how long is this going to take? My answer is always, first of all, I can't tell you, I don't know. But in my experience, sort of the deeper the belief is, or the longer, the longer the problem has been going on, the longer it takes for it to improve. You know, so like I said, if this is a one off situation in which this is the first time you've ever experienced this, probably going to move a lot faster than this has been a lifelong issue. Yeah, no, oftentimes, you know, I, I will, you know, share something very similar, you know, with people who um, I'm working with, or people who are interested in understanding more about what we do. Mm -hmm. um, I think it also goes for like the duration of how long the problem has been going on, as well as with age. Mm -hmm. um, so I find that like, you know, younger men who are experiencing erection challenges for the first time or the first couple of times tend to be more responsive to treatments in this much, you know, tighter range of sessions than people mm -hmm. who have been struggling with this challenge for quite some time. Right. That have sort of these deeply entrenched uh, fears, concerns, this is going to be a problem forever. And they've, they've had a long time to have those worries. So they're, they're very comfortable and familiar with those worries. They've amassed some anecdotal evidence right, that they've lost relationships in the past and whatnot, exactly. uh, which, which allows those beliefs to become more and more entrenched. Mm-hmm. Okay. So a lot of times, you know, it, you know, when I'm doing this work, I see that people are conflating different types of anxiety when it comes to trying to understand what might be contributing to their sexual function. So in your experience, how does stress play a role in causing or exacerbating erectile dysfunction? It plays a lot of roles in it. Uh, first of all, is just sort of the, the low lying chemical and hormonal role that it plays in terms of just sort of the slow, steady release of cortisol ongoing is not good for one's erectile functioning, first of all. 
But there's also this psychological piece that I notice happening that there is this uh, belief that a lot of men practice that they should be sexual on a moment's notice. They should be able to have an erection spontaneously. The minute their partner says, let's go, they should be at the ready. And the reality is, is that, you know, men are three-dimensional humans with their own needs and experiences as well. And so one of the conflicts that I witness a lot is that people are stressed, they're tired, they're hungry, they didn't get a chance to exercise, they didn't sleep enough. And this belief that like they should still want to feel sexual or they should still want sex, even given all these other stressors. And so then there's this internal conflict of like, what's wrong with me that I can't get an erection? And it's like, well, did you look at all this other stuff happening in your life? Maybe that's contributing. But for some reason, there's this blind spot of like, oh, no, 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 but that shouldn't impact me. Yeah, and it sounds like that that, that kind of speaks to that uh, masculinity construct um, mm -hmm. that you were alluding to, um, you know, towards the beginning of this interview, um, that a lot of men do hold on to that, right? That like, yeah. I'm not supposed to be impacted by this. And like, I should be able to, like, not even work through it, it shouldn't have any impact on me. Like, I should just right. be able like to my penis is its own operating entity, and it should be immune to anything that I personally am experiencing. <laughs> Right, right. Even though it really only responds, generally speaking, with the appropriate stimuli. Correct. But in any case, when I want to use it, I should be able to. And you're saying that mm -hmm. that that is a you know common uh, misconception that a lot yeah. of men carry. So, so piggybacking off of that, what strategies have you found to be effective with the men that you've worked with in reducing stress? and or performance anxiety that is impacting erections? And how have men been able to regain a sense of confidence and exit those anxiety loops? Well, so first of all, I remind my clients that their body is impacted by stress. So first of all, normalizing the response that their body is having because it makes sense. If you are stressed, this is not going to be a high priority for you. Your body's not going to react the way you want it to, even if you, if you think it should. So I certainly normalize that stress does play a role. With almost all clients that come to me for erectile dysfunction concerns, when they leave my office after the first session, either the first or second session, I almost always recommend starting a meditation practice. Uh, a lot of these clients are sort of buzzing at this high frequency and their body is paying the toll for it. So with almost all of these clients, they need to unplug, like they need their body to relax and have a, a moment of being off. So with almost all my clients, I encourage them to start a meditation practice, even if it's five minutes a day, but just giving their body five minutes a day in which they can relax and not be buzzing at this high frequency. Okay. And I'm just going to pause you here for a moment because I know our listeners are going to be interested in this. It's so hard oftentimes to tease these things out when you're you know, obtaining information online, you're Googling, what should I do? Mm -hmm. The meditation practice is the intention of that to be like a daily practice to just lower just general like buzz and, you know, cognitive noise up inside of somebody's head to bring stress levels somewhat lower? Or is this intended to be a a uh, tool or a strategy to be used during sexual activity, right prior to sexual activity, or in the event that an erection is not coming? So it's actually both, but it's one of those things where if you don't exercise the muscle, you won't be able to use the muscle. So in the grand scheme of things, it is intended to bring the overall anxiety level down. But it's also intended to help them in these moments when they're in extreme panic it's a, a tool that they can ground themselves in, but they can't use the tool and their body won't know how to use the tool if it's not something that they're practicing regularly. So oftentimes a lot of people are resistant to meditation, but if there's a possibility that could help their erectile functioning, they're more inclined to try it. So that's certainly a helpful aspect. But yes, if I were to say, you know, just meditate because you'll feel better. People are like, yeah, I, I'm good. <laughs> 
Um, okay, so I, I apologize because I did cut you off in the middle of that list. You had mentioned um, <clears throat> some of the psychoeducation, normalizing, meditation. What are some of the other um, approaches or strategies that you have found to be effective? A lot of unpacking the false beliefs that are promoting the anxiety. So this belief of I will be alone forever, or even the belief of like, this partner is going to leave me. Uh, the belief that I'm broken, I'm not a man, something's wrong with me. Diving into each and every one of those beliefs that are promoting the anxiety and helping the client reflect on how true is this? You know, what are some other possibilities here? What What is the reality in this situation? Helping them to see that they they don't have to be afraid. And then I would also say another strategy is, is helping clients really reframe their understanding of a sexual experience. Uh, one of the things I tell almost all my clients, probably all of them is the broader your definition of sex, the more sex you can be having. And so if you are telling yourself the only way to have sex is to insert my penis into someone, it's very limiting. Whereas if you can broaden your definition of sex, you can have significantly more sexual experiences. And many of those do not require an erect penis. So I also really help to help people to sort of reframe their understanding of, of how to have sex. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it, it is a lot of pressure when the working definition of sex, sexual activity, physical intimacy um, does require an erection, almost immediate in a lot of people's minds, that is adequate for penetration. Mm -hmm. um, it's a lot, a lot of pressure. So if you already have that predisposition to performance anxiety because previous experiences have not gone well, um, I, I have found that a lot of guys do put a lot of pressure on themselves. So um, and a more, yeah, a more expansive definition. It sounds like what you're saying is a more expansive definition of intimacy, sexual activity, having more options at one's uh, disposal uh, to be able to engage in that intimacy can really help also kind of just reduce the pressure um, mm -hmm. and create, again, just more opportunities for sexual intimacy. Yeah. Okay. Now, I want to kind of go back to the mind-body connection because it is a, it's a tough concept to really wrap one's head around. Um, can you talk a little bit about how improving one's mental health, like what the you know positive implications are, not just for erections per se, but also on arousal um, in particular, because I think it's an overlooked uh, aspect of the erection process. I know we talk a lot about the cortisol impacting the blood flow, um, but on the positive side, we also need like some form of stimulation um, that's arousing. And a lot of times that has to do with like the mental side much more than the physical or the physiological side of stimulation. So could you speak a little bit toward like, like a mindset um, that might work to counter some of that performance anxiety, but also facilitate, you know, increased arousal, which could lead to better erections, but also better experience overall? Yeah. So there are certainly so many people who I've worked with who had no idea that they might actually need to touch their penis or have somebody touch it in order for the arousal process to happen. I've had so many people say like, yeah, I used to think about sex and I would get erect and now I, I think about it and nothing happens. And so there's certainly the knowledge piece around you know, well, your body might need more physical stimulation. But in terms of like the mind body connection, we also just live in a, a day and an age in which we are so disconnected from our bodies, everything is happening in our head and our brain, what the shoulds, the shouldn'ts, you know, what everything is supposed to look like. And I can't tell you how many people have sat on my couch and I've asked them what's happening in your body and they go, huh, I have no idea what you're asking me. So I would say the same is true for their relationship with their penis oftentimes. So it, it, and it kind of begs the question of like, if you don't know what's happening in your body or your penis, like how can you, how can you be having this experience that involves your penis? <laughs> um, so I would say like the mind body connection is really important because, you know, that is part of where the arousal comes from. The other piece is so many people are so heavily reliant on visual stimulation on watching porn. And from my perspective, it's sort of really weakened all the other senses, all the other awarenesses as it relates to sexuality. So this, there's, there's a huge block around, you know, utilizing sensation for stimulation. It's all about what am I looking at? What am I seeing? How many different videos can I watch within the span of two minutes 
you know, how do I curate this perfect sexual experience that I want, which is so different from the in-person sexual experience. And so when people are with another person in front of them and they're having this sexual encounter, it's really important to know how does this feel? Like, what does it feel like when this person touches me here? What does it feel like when they touch me here? But because we're so disconnected from these things, then it all turns into the head game of, you know, what's happening in my body? What am I doing? Are they happy? What's going on? And and there's this huge disconnect. Okay, that's super, super helpful. So kind of building off of the relational side that you just mentioned, can you speak a little bit to the role of communication between a guy experiencing erection challenges or perhaps any other sexual challenge and his partner and the role that communication plays in perhaps addressing or at least mitigating the impact of performance anxiety. I am a huge fan of front loading these conversations. Uh, I think it's, it reduces anxiety. It, reduces it it creates realistic expectations um oftentimes when people don't talk about these things i hear so many people say yeah i'll I'll tell my partner later and then they enter into these sexual encounters and they're just seething with anxiety (laughs) versus hey i just want to give you a heads up you know i'm having this thing go on with my body right now i don't really know what it's about but i just want to be clear that like i'm really into you and i don't want you to think otherwise um, despite you know how my body reacts in the moment, I have a uh, a mentor who used to say, or who still says, the best time to have a to- uh, the best time to talk about sex is over a cup of coffee at the kitchen table. So this idea of like the more you can have a casual conversation about it, you know, in the heat of the moment is not the time to talk about it. If you can front load it, if you can talk about it in advance, if you can make the expectations clear, if you can create empathy and understanding in a moment that's not highly charged and highly emotional and highly loaded, the better it will be for all partners involved. Yeah. And um, I, I, I will just mention to our listeners that that it is really powerful when somebody can do that. It also is highly vulnerable, which I think is part of the reason why Mm -hmm. people are oftentimes having these conversations in the heat of the moment, because you're already in a very vulnerable position and like that's, it's already very heightened, but I do agree, Natalie, that it's, it's highly ineffective Mm -hmm. in the moment. And these conversations tend to deliver much better results, even if they are more vulnerable and it can feel uncomfortable, certainly getting those conversations started in the beginning for people who are not used to having them. Um, but they do tend to go a whole lot better when it's not in the heat of the moment, when you are less vulnerable, when you are less in an escalated position, I should say, mm-hmm. and when your partner is also in a less escalated position. That that kitchen table conversation, like just talking about like, here are my challenges. How do you feel mm-hmm. about that? What's happening on the other side tends to go a whole lot better, but it is hard to do that. Yeah. Well, and I think the other thing that happens is that oftentimes when people sort of make this reveal in the heat of the moment, it's because they've been pushed to the break. They tried to keep it a secret. They didn't want to talk about it. They held off as long as possible. And then here you are, you know, having a sexual experience that isn't going the way you wanted it to. And so you feel forced to talk about it. And so it brings a very different energy to it rather than this sort of, I'm voluntarily bringing this up and there's more choice in the process. You know, I think people always operate better when they feel like they're coming from a place of choice rather than feeling forced. Yes. So I'm wondering in your experience, do you, do you have any advice for a, uh, a man who's experiencing erection challenges and is actively dating? Um, this question comes up you know, quite often because, you know, a lot of what, you know, I think we are encouraging people to do is to be vulnerable mm-hmm. and like, to be able to trust their partner, which is hard enough in a established relationship because mm-hmm. people oftentimes are not talking about these things. Um, for a man who's, who's dating and maybe is approaching a first sexual experience with a partner and is having performance anxiety, how do you... Um, you know, talk about that or, or um, advise or guide somebody who comes to you with that conundrum about how to bring that up to a first time sexual partner? I always encourage people to 
to lay their cards on the table. Um, because the reality of what usually plays out is they don't say anything and then the person ghosts them or they don't have any context. They don't understand. They take it personally. I can't tell you how many people I've worked with who have, have taken it personally as a partner. So I would say it never ends well when you don't talk about it. Whereas if you do talk about it, it's almost more like you have a 50-50 chance. There's a 50% chance that the person will be understanding, empathic, they'll, they'll experience it differently, they'll see it differently. And then there is still the 50% chance that they'll say, this is too much, I don't want to deal with this. I don't, I don't know what this is about. Okay, but in your, in your experience, you're saying the risk that's involved in that, and obviously you have to be tactful about how one brings this up to a potential partner, um, but you're saying the, the reward outweighs the risk because I would tend to agree with you if you are withholding that information and you are concerned, worried, and nervous about it, odds are things are not going to go as you would hope they would. Mm-hmm. And there's a much higher probability that this this you know partner, potential partner, is going to take it personally, is going mm-hmm. to believe that they did something wrong or they are not attractive, and it's much less likely a relationship like that is going to proceed forward. Correct. I wanted to get your opinion. It's also a big question that comes up with our listeners. I want to get like a sex therapist's uh, point of view on the following. What are your thoughts about medical treatments and medical interventions for erectile dysfunction that, you know, is seemingly, you know, caused by psychological factors like performance anxiety? I'm a huge fan of them. I think they're very helpful. And quite frankly, they can be a huge, uh, they, they can be very helpful in the psychological process. Oftentimes for men, when they have the experience of not having an erection, you know, it's sort of, it's sort of like their brain takes a mental snapshot of the scene, the scenario, what happened. I mean, one of the things we know about the brain is sort of how it stores trauma. So what often happens is that like that tidbit of information gets stored. This isn't going to happen. It's not going to work. And so one of the ways that I feel like the medication can be really helpful is that it can help give them sort of like living proof that their body can do this. It can rewrite that mental snapshot of looking down at a flaccid penis. Suddenly, if they look down and they see the erection, the volume of confidence that comes with that is immeasurable. So I think it's really helpful in a confidence confidence boosting perspective and in terms of rewriting the negative feedback loop around Mm -hmm. sex and negative anticipation. The one thing that I have been told by doctors about the medications is that in the event that somebody is highly, highly, highly anxious, even if they're erectile problems are psychologically based, there are no physical problems, their body's anxiety levels can override the uh, impacts of the medication. And so there's that. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, we've we've covered that topic in in a couple of different angles, Um, especially, I think what you were referencing is the oral medications. Mm -hmm. Yes, correct. The oral medications. seem to really be like, they're an enhancement, they really are enhancers or they're, they're, you know, vasodilators of the natural mm-hmm. process. But as many of the people who listen to this podcast are already aware, um, until there is stimulation, they don't begin to work. It's not like an instant uh, type of medication. That's why you can take them well in advance. Mm-hmm. Um, and until you are in the right situation or scenario, they don't respond. So to that end, if somebody is highly anxious, it's very difficult to be receptive to some of the classic stimulation Um, that otherwise would trip that up. So that anxiety can override it. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think what you're also pointing out is that's that's also not a sign that the body is not able to do what it is supposed to do. That's oftentimes a sign that somebody is very highly anxious. And that natural process that we're trying to help along with that medication isn't really able to kick in. Exactly. Okay. But generally speaking, it sounds like you are, um, you see the benefits um, of a medicinal intervention to break some of those anxiety loops, even if it is a psychogenic ED. Um, and, correct. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. I definitely uh, support people utilizing medication. And I, I mean, I also talk about it in the sense of this is not 
a long-term fix. This is to help you get your confidence back um, unless you need it long-term for physical reasons. But yes, if it's psychological ED, oftentimes it's more about helping regain confidence. Yeah. And I, I, I have, you know, worked with a number of doctors who have informed me that sometimes they will prescribe the medication and tell their patients before you take it, just know that it's there. Um, and they have had some instances where that knowledge alone, that there is something that will help get that job yeah, done. Yeah, having it in their actually... back pocket. Exactly. It's enough to ease that anxiety. Um, and there are you know, some patients they have that have been able to at least resolve ED. Again, I, I, I'm always hesitant about the word resolve because I think it's, sure. a, <laughs> it's a lifelong <laughs> reality. Mm -hmm. But at least for that that stage of where they are, have been able to resolve or overcome that uh, anxiety loop um, yeah. and whatnot. So, um, Natalie, if I um, ask you to kind of share some final thoughts or words with our listeners for any men out there who are struggling with performance anxiety in particular. And I know it's an experience that when men are having it, they, they, a lot of times they know it, like they know that they're having those looping thoughts and whatnot. Um, but I also know that it's hard. It's hard to kind of reach out for help and talk mm -hmm. to somebody. I know that there are, again, like we're talking about medical interventions that could be again, more discreet, a lot easier, um, to not talk about things, but I think you and I both, both know that there are a lot of times if there's an underlying piece um, there are like wide ranging benefits beyond just the resolution of or improvement of sexual performance. So um, if I were to ask you to give like some final words to our listeners, what would they be? I would say that people tend to be drawn to confidence. Confidence, generally speaking, is sexy. And so even if your body is doing this thing that you don't want it to do or don't like that it does or doesn't do, if you can approach it with confidence, that's what's sexy. Like if you can sit at that kitchen table and you can say, hey, babe, we got to talk about something. You need to know this about my body. I know this about my body. I want you to know it. It's very different and it's much more attractive uh, than the alternative, than sort of, you know, shrinking back, hiding. I don't want to talk about it. Leave me alone you know, and then sort of retreating to your corner and, and spiraling in your own anxiety. So, you know, I think part of this is also understanding just because your body is doing this thing, it doesn't have to have that. It doesn't have to mean that you can't be confident, that you can't own it. Like, you know, it's your body. We don't have control over our bodies all the time. But what you do have control over is your relationship to your body. And so you can hate that it does this thing. You can, you know, beat yourself up for it. You can spiral or you can say, you know what? My body does this thing and I know that about my body. And here's how I'm going to work with it. So I would say I think confidence is really important. Yeah, that is that is really powerful. I really appreciate just that 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 whole idea of just like owning it and tackling it head on, you know, with your partner approaching it with a sense of like, again, confidence as opposed to trying to hide it, you know, trying to skirt around the issue. You're saying that mm -hmm. that that likely is going to have a much more positive impact um, on the partner um, and really kind of help like move things in a much more positive direction a lot quicker. Yes. Um, so Natalie, thank you very much for joining us. This has been like super informative and really, really great to get like a perspective on this really important topic from a fellow sex very therapist. Very important, yes. Yes, very <laughs> important topic. I would love to have you on again for another episode. There's so many additional topics in the psychological, psychogenic, and relational space that we're looking I'd forward to covering. I'd be happy to. In the future. That would be yeah. really, really great. And for our listeners, um, for anybody out there on the West Coast, at least in California, um, we're going to leave, sorry, so I'm other asking... states... Yeah, I'm actually licensed in, let's see, California, Arizona, Montana, Texas, and Florida. <laughs> okay, so. Um, and I that have covers an online class that people can enroll in regardless of where they're located. <laughs> okay, so we're going we're gonna to leave a link um, to uh, Natalie's practice um, and her resources um, in the notes. So anybody who's in any of those states looking for somebody who um they can see for uh, psychogenic ed and they're ready to reach out uh, natalie would be an excellent option and we would encourage that so once again natalie thank you very much thank you for having me